Okay, so uh, as we go through this, uh, the key thing I want you to note, and I'm going to go ahead and keep the the uh, chat window open so that as we go through, you can add things or ask questions as we go along. Uh, because I am recording this live, I do not. I am not showing your faces. So if you want to unmute and speak, that's the best way because I will not see you trying to get my attention. All right. So let's go ahead and begin. So at the end of World War I, we uh, have the war comes to an end. And if you remember, one of the key things uh, to think about is with World War I, how did it happen? Remember the acronym MAIN, militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. Those four things working together set up uh, the world to engage in what we now know as World War I. Unless those issues are addressed, the wars like that will continue to become a thing. And so when we're talking about the peace conference, the Paris Peace Conference that happens at the end of the war, a few months after the war is over, we're going to be talking about what provisions or ideas were created in that that made it possible for World War II to happen? All right, and so let's go ahead and go through it. <clears throat> so several months after World War I comes to an end, uh, world leaders from 32 different countries are brought to the city of Paris, to the Palace of Versailles, to discuss what to do about the defeated countries, specifically what to do about Germany. Now, Germany is specifically singled out because it is the only one of the countries that began the war under the central powers that is still a, considered a powerful nation, right? It's still intact, it still has its government, although the government leaders have changed. But Austria-Hungary is no more. Um, Ottoman Empire is no more. And so when the war is over, the only country left to be dealt with as a unified one nation is the country of Germany. Leading this information, leading this peace treaty or this delegation are what we call the big four, sometimes referred to as the big three because uh, the representative of because the representative of, uh, sorry, um, come on. Because the representative of Italy, Victorio Orlando, while he was technically considered one of the hosts, he was really only there to pacify Italy. And I'll explain more about that as we get into the breakdown of what actually happens at the treaty. So the key figures that we need to know that are invited are 32 countries from around the world with the three major countries, the United States, France, and Britain being the, the perceived leaders of the conference. And specifically two countries were not invited and why they were not invited matters. Germany is not invited to the conference, nor is Russia. Now, the reason why Germany is not invited is because they were the defeated country, right? In the eyes of the Western Europeans, in particular England and France, Germany was the biggest threat during the war and was the cause of the war. Now, you can argue whether or not that is true. Technically, it is not true because the war began when uh, the Serbian nationals attacked and killed uh, the Austrian-Hungarian uh, heir, right? The Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his family. But Germany, because they were the most industrially developed country among the central powers and kicked off the fighting in Western Europe, they were considered the ones to blame for the war, especially given that at the end of the war, Germany is the only country still standing, okay? Okay. <clears throat> So as we go through this, one of the things I want you to keep in mind is how the countries of Germany and Russia must feel when the war is over and how the Western European nations are going to treat them, because this becomes relevant as we begin to look at 
why World War II happens. Okay, so the key players in the war or in the peace treaty were president of the United States at the time, President Woodrow Wilson. Okay, uh, he uh, had a very specific view on what he wanted from the conference. And we'll go into their views in just a few minutes. But the idea is that uh, President Wilson, who was well-educated, he was a college professor, he was a history professor, in fact, uh, he saw a lot of problems with uh, punishing Germany after the war. And one of the big things that he's going to emphasize is that we should not create a peace that is built on, as he put it, built on quicksand that uh, will be unstable and cannot hold. We should instead seek to make a proper foundation and a stable Germany so that war will no longer be an option for the German people. Okay, and this is an important information because he believed that in creating what he called his 14 points, that if we could go by these 14 points, and we'll go into details of those in just a minute, that peace could be something that is universal around the world forever. Okay, remember the ideas of the enlightenment that we talked about in previous units, right? This idea that if only we had enough knowledge with science and logic and reason, we can make war and disease and famine a thing of the past. Wilson truly believed in those ideas. And he believed that if we could, in dealing with Germany after the war, establish a new norm on how to deal with countries that are problems, that we could fix the world and make it better and safer. Okay, the leader of uh, England was the Prime Minister David Lloyd George. Uh, he was a the Prime Minister, Prime Minister, the elected uh, equivalent of our president. So he was technically in charge of England, although. Like in America, his office is limited by the lawmakers within the British government. Now, he really had a, a beef to settle with Germany. Uh, his main thing that he was looking at was Germany is a threat to the British military in terms of its naval power. And he wanted to make sure that Germany could no longer threaten the seas. And so one of the things that uh, David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister of England wanted, was to reduce the size of Germany's Navy, right? He did not want them to become a military threat in the future, especially when it came to the Navy, because England at the time had the world's strongest Navy and did not want it rivaled. George Clemenceau was the Prime Minister of France, much like David Lloyd George, he was an elected official, represented kind of the president of France. And he was concerned that Germany not be allowed to uh, keep its military, its army, right? His big thing was he felt that Germany will constantly be a threat to French interests because again, remember back in history, they've had a long history of wars between France and Germany, right? Going all the way back to even before Napoleon. And so his concern was, was that uh, he wanted two things from the treaty. He One, he wanted Germany to pay for the damages it caused during the war, what we call reparations. We'll talk about that term in a moment. And he also wanted Germany to dismantle or completely take apart its entire military, especially its army. They did not want Germany in a position where they could threaten France again in the future. Okay, so you've got two of the three major leaders of, of the peace treaty actually seeking revenge, right? They want, they want the military disbanded. They want Germany punished. Uh, France even wants to go further and say economically, we want Germany to pay to rebuild France because they started the war. These are all issues, again, to keep in mind. Okay, looking at the political cartoon here, um, you can see that this represents Germany, and you can see all the different countries that were involved in bringing Germany to the peace, agree peace agreement, and they're going to force, these four nations are going to force uh, Germany to accept it, right? Germany was not allowed to surrender under its own terms they were forced to surrender in what we call an unconditional surrender. And what that means is 
that uh, an unconditional surrender means that the other countries that won the war get to decide what happens, right? Normally, when you surrender, you get to make terms. Say, look, we will surrender. We will stop fighting if, in fact, um, you allow our prisoners, to, the prison, political or military prisoners you're holding, allow them to return home, return our property that you've confiscated, et cetera, et cetera, right? You normally negotiate all of that for a peaceful surrender. Germany was not given that option. They were told you surrender unconditionally or we keep fighting. And so Germany is forced to accept whatever ruling comes out of the peace agreement because they do not have a voice at the, at the meeting. Okay, uh, here are some key terms that you should be familiar with. Um, you can read them and, and prep them yourselves. But I want you to know that um, understanding these terms is beneficial for you, all right? They will help you to kind of figure out um, kind of questions on the exams, things in the textbook reading that you'll do and so on, all right? So let's look at what Wilson wanted from the treaty. Wilson's was by far the most reasonable um, ask when it came to creating a lasting peace in Europe. He called his uh, ideas the 14 points. He had 14 chapters or paragraphs, what we call provisions, articles, that were designed to, in his mind, if all 14 can get approved, what that means is that we will have peace pretty much forever. Now, the key thing to note about these 14 points is, remember, in order to solve the problem, we have to address the four issues that caused World War I. Nationalism, I'm sorry, militarism, a system of alliances, imperialism, and out of control nationalism, right, Maine. With those four things, if those four things are addressed, war can be a thing of the past. But if any one of them is allowed to exist and continue, in Wilson's eyes, war would happen again. So let's look at how Wilson's 14 points plan to address those issues. The first thing, and for the first five provisions, uh, Wilson's ideas talk about essentially uh, breaking down barriers. One, he wants to get rid of all secret alliances, right? So again, addressing the alliance factor. If you want to deal with a country, deal above board, let it be publicly known that you are forming a friendship, whether it's economic, military, whatever. The world needs to know that you have a partner, okay? He calls for the freedom of seas during peace and war, okay? So that's going to address some of the issues of militarism, right? That we're going to get rid of uh, the threat of military when it comes to economic trade between countries. Even if a war is going on, innocent vessels, innocent ships that are not transporting goods should be left alone, not freely targeted like they were towards the end of World War I, which with the Lusitania attack uh, and sinking was one of the reasons why America comes into the war. Okay, he wants, secondly, he wants to deal with, or thirdly, he wants to deal with free trade, open trade between countries, right? If you trade with other countries, if you do business with other countries and come in contact with people from those countries, his idea is that this idea of nationalism will decrease, right? If you've ever grown up in a neighborhood where everybody looked like you, talked like you, uh, dressed like you, and then suddenly found yourself in a different environment, right? Maybe you go out of state, maybe you go to a fancy restaurant or something, and you suddenly feel like an outsider. It's very easy to other those people, right? Or to be other, dismissed as, oh, here comes the here comes the poor kid, here comes the kid who doesn't know anything. Oh, here's that kid who's, you know, filling whatever uh, othering you want to put in. So, if we want to break down extreme nationalism, we have to open up our borders between connections. And economics is one of the best and easiest ways to do that. Because if we trade with other people in other countries, we learn about their culture, they learn about ours, and extreme nationalism becomes much more difficult to follow. 
Okay, so again, just in this first five alone, he's addressing the idea of alliances, right, which was one of them. He's addressing uh, militarism by decreasing the threat during peace and war of civilian vessels. He's looking to decrease nationalism by um, getting rid of or by opening up borders for trade. And finally, the last one, imperialism, right, militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism imperialism he wants the european nations to give up and surrender their colonies allow those colonies to become independent free from control of colonial rule by the european nations so in the first five provisions of his of his ideas he's addressing all of the problems that caused world war one militarism alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. Will it completely work? We don't know, because not all of the provisions make it. Some make it, some don't, right? There's always compromise. But what we do know is that he at least was looking at the big picture and looking to solve the problem. He was not about revenge. He was not about punishment. He was about how do we make peace that lasts forever? Okay, the next few provisions are dealing with what to do with these colonies and these nations that were created as a result of the war. So remember, at the end of the war, the Ottoman Empire broke up into about 13 different countries. Russia lost a lot of its territory as they fought, as the people in Russia fought for independence, right? Because remember, Russia was going through a, a civil war. Um, Germany lost its colonies because of losing the war, and Britain and France lost some control over their colonies, and Austria-Hungary, who was one of the big separate, but from there, several other countries were created. So what Wilson calls for in the provisions 6 through 13 is that we want to establish rules for how these new countries that are formed will create their borders, will create their governments, and where they will fit in the big picture. He really emphasized the idea of what he called self-determination, allowing the colonies and these new countries to decide for themselves what type of government they want. If they want a monarchy and, and want to choose a king or a queen, they can do so. If they want a, a democracy where they elect their officials, whatever type of government they want, Wilson's view was it's their choice, right? We're not going to try to impose America's will on it. We're not going to allow the Russians to impose their will on it. We want them to do it on their own. And then finally, the last provision of consequence was... Wilson wanted to create what he called a general association of nations. It ultimately becomes known as the League of Nations, and it is the precursor or what happens before we ultimately create the United Nations. The idea of this general association or this League of Nations is he wanted to create around the world a governmental and international government body that countries could take their problems to, right? If a problem develops between nations, rather than going to war, they could instead bring it to this, this league where the people sitting on the board of the league would help determine a peaceful res resolution. Again, this goes back to the idea that if we get together regularly as world leaders and talk, we can avoid, we can understand each other, we can understand different perspectives, and we're less likely to go to war. So Wilson's plan for a long-lasting peace was a good one. Unfortunately, he's not going to be able to get all of his ideas through into the final document. And we'll talk about which ones he did uh, in a moment. All right. Uh, one of the questions on your document asks, what are the goals of the big four? What is it that each of these countries wanted uh, when dealing with uh, sort of organizing a peace agreement? Okay, in the United States, we've kind of already covered, right? President Wilson wanted to get his 14 points as part of the document. He wanted an agreement that would be considered fair and does not place blame. Again, he's not interested in blaming anybody for starting the war. The war happened. It's done. doesn't matter how it started. How do we prevent it in the future? That's what he was focused on. And he wanted to make sure that he walked away with 
the League of Nations intact, something that he wanted to create. Great Britain, as I said earlier, wanted to punish Germany. In particular, they wanted to punish Germany by destroying its navy, right? Limiting its naval power so that it could not threaten British colonies or Britain itself directly anymore. France wanted similar, only instead of focusing on the navy, France wanted to punish Germany and focus on destroying its army, right? It decreased the size of its army dramatically to prevent it from uh, invading France ever again. In addition, because France lost the most property and territory as a result of the war, France wanted Germany to pay for the rebuilding, pay what is known as reparations. Reparations are payments uh, as kind of an apology for doing something wrong, right? So for example, if you were playing in your front yard and you know playing baseball or kicking a soccer ball or whatever you were doing, and you accidentally broke a neighbor's window, right? You kick the ball and it breaks the window. A good part of a humanity and good human would go knock on the door, say, you know, I'm really sorry I broke your window. Can you figure out how much it'll cost? And I'll figure out how to pay for it, right? Because you didn't do it on purpose. So you pay for it. You make good, right? So you can be forgiven because you've repaired the damage that you caused. Reparation payments are like that, but on a larger scale. Uh, reparation payments are ways of apologizing for long-standing wrong. And then finally, the last of the big four, Italy, they were there because Germany threatened it, Italy in terms of its military strength because Italy sits down below. And they wanted to make sure that Germany was not able to get revenge for them changing sides. Remember, Italy was once in an alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary but they changed sides based on a promise by Britain to be given land taken from Germany. So Italy, who wanted to industrialize, saw switching sides in the war as an opportunity to improve Italy's strength in Europe, okay? And then when the war is over, they're gonna show up at basically demand from Britain land from Germany that was uh, after they were defeated they're not gonna luck out. They're going to actually suffer a bit. So we now know the goals of all the members. What actually made its way into the treaty? So some of Wilson's 14 points did make it into the treaty, but not enough of it. A lot of it was still punishment for Germany. France and England in particular imposed rules that are considered very restrictive and really set Germany up for failure. And they didn't care because in their mind, Germany started the war, they must be punished. What was in the treaty were the following things and you need to be familiar with these. One, uh, there will be a creation of the League of Nations, right? Out of Wilson's 14 points, this league that will be created specifically to help address issues and problems between countries rather than allowing them to go to war. Germany is going to be forced to surrender some land along its border. I'll show you on a map in a minute what land they are forced to give up. This land really hurts Germany because in this area is where most of Germany's coal and iron mines are located. Most of its heavy industry is located in that region. And if Germany wants to have any hope of rebuilding its economy after the war, they need those resources, but it, they're going to lose them uh, because they're gonna be turned over to either France or England or used by France and England, okay? Germany must give up all of its overseas territories. All of its colonies are, are gonna be surrendered. Again, if Germany wants to rebuild as an industrial nation, remember in order to industrialize, you need access to raw materials and you need access to markets to sell your finished goods by surrendering their major land and resource rich land along the border of France, Germany is going to reduce its ability to industrialize. By surrendering its overseas territories, Germany is going to reduce its ability to industrialize. Germany is going to be suffering economically for a long time. In addition, Germany must uh, reduce the size of its military across the board. They are only allowed to have a very specific number of military troops that are necessary for maintaining the peace within the country, 
nothing more. So they cannot have a military that could potentially threaten their neighbors. Germany must take responsibility for the war. In other words, they call this the war guilt clause, meaning Germany must state publicly that they started the war and that they're sorry. Here's the problem. Germany didn't start the war. Austria-Hungary started the war. Germany, like everybody else, got caught up in the system of alliances and became part of the war. Nothing different than any of the other countries in the war, yet because Germany is the only country standing and somebody has to be blamed and take responsibility, Germany is going to be forced to publicly humiliate itself by taking responsibility for the war. Part of the humiliation of that is, in addition to losing territory, within losing its lands, losing its overseas territories, reducing its military, taking responsibility for the war, the final insult is Germany must pay France and England a total of $33 billion to help them rebuild after the war. How is Germany supposed to do that when it's a country's been, it, it as a country has been devastated by the war as well, right? Because British and French troops invaded Germany uh, once they started losing the war. They've surrendered their land, which most of their resources are located in. They've surrendered their overseas territories where the rest of their resources are located. And now they're supposed to pay for a war without being able to rebuild their economy. This is going to be a problem. Germany was angry about this, but they had no choice. They had to take it, right? They surrendered unconditionally. Germany felt punished and abused by the, the Western European nations. Germany is gonna face many years of economic struggle. The whole world will as the Great Depression will kick in uh, in a few years after the war, but Germany will especially see suffering because of the economic hardships imposed by the treaty. And the German people are going to feel anger, anger at their government for accepting such a horrible agreement angry at the Western European nations for imposing such horrible restrictions and angry at, and in general uh, at the government because the whole time that Germany was fighting, the newspapers who were owned by the military or owned by the government were telling stories about how Germany was winning the war. So German people, the German people were surprised to hear Germany lost because in their mind, we were doing great. Everything was wonderful. And so there's going to be a lot of anger and hardship in the years to come. And that's going to spill out into the streets. All right. So as I said earlier, uh, Germany is going to be forced to surrender lands as part of the peace treaty. So all of this area, all the brown and the yellow and the orange, all of this area was all Germany at the start of the World War. Okay, when the treaty is signed, Germany is going to have to give up land that it had taken from France back in the 1800s. So the area of Alsace-Lorraine, which is an area where there are a lot of coal mines and iron mines, right? Things that are necessary for industrialization. They're also going to have to give up an area known as the Rhineland, right? Now they do not give it up. They do not give up ownership of it right? They are not allowed to put military in here. We call it a demilitarized zone. They're not allowed to have their military in this region. And all of the profits from this region, again, where there's oil, coal, iron, all of these things are located in this region. All of the profits from that are going to go to France and England. So while they still technically own it, they do not control it while they are forced to pay reparations. In addition, on the eastern side of Germany, uh, in order to give Poland access to the ocean for trade purposes, Germany is going to have to give up this whole area of land known as the Polish Corridor uh, in order to allow Poland access to the seas. This is going to divide Germany into multiple countries. So East Prussia, which is still part of Germany, will now become an independent nation and Germany will lose much of its ability, all right, uh, to rebuild. Sorry, let me clarify. So 
The areas that we need to notice are the Rhineland. These are going to come up again in World War II. Alsace-Lorraine, right, which they called the Sudetenland, and the Polish Corridor. Okay, all of these lands are going to be taken from Germany uh, as punishment for being involved in World War I. All right, you guys can watch the video on your own. I'm not going to take the time to show it now. It basically talks about the treaty and some of the ideas behind it. So do take a few minutes to watch it, but you can do that again on your own time. Moving on. So what happens to the other countries? Well, Austria-Hungary uh, becomes multiple countries. It becomes two separate uh, countries with a bunch of smaller countries breaking off based on ethnic and uh, religious lines. So Austria-Hungary becomes the countries of Austria and Hungary. Czechoslovakia breaks away and Yugoslavia break away and they all form their own independent nations. So Austria-Hungary as an empire is gone. In the Middle East, the Ottoman Empire is going to be broken up into a bunch of different factions that become nation states. The country of Palestine, Iraq, and Transjordan, which today we call Jordan, uh, were, instead of being allowed to be independent like Wilson called for, were instead made independent from the Ottoman Empire, but taken control of by Britain. So Britain basically took away those colonies from the Ottoman Empire and made them British colonies because those areas are rich in oil and natural resources that you need from the Industrial Revolution. Syria and Lebanon, two other Middle Eastern countries, were placed under the control of France. So again, Ottoman Empire is broken up. And instead of allowing the countries to create independent nations, they instead are going to be allowed to break up, but are going to be ruled by a European nation. Now, what's interesting to note, uh, and well, let's go into Russia, and then I'll come back to my interesting note. In Russia, because Russia falls apart because of the revolution that pulls them out of the war, many new independent nations are going to develop there as well. Romania, Poland, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania will all become independent nations, no longer ruled by Russia. So the Russian Empire is gone, the German Empire is gone, the Ottoman Empire is gone, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire is gone. Now there are a bunch of independent nations. Now what's interesting is the white territories, Eastern Europe and Russia, they are going to be able to create their own governments, their own state borders, and establish themselves as independent nations. But the people of color in the Middle East, the former Ottomans, while, while they break free from the oppressive rule of the Ottoman Empire, are not allowed to be free and independent. Instead, they're going to be placed under the control of European nations. This is social Darwinism back at work. This idea that our culture is better than their culture, and therefore we must make them more like us. So in Eastern Europe, where the people are mostly white, in the Russian territories, in Southern Europe, where the people are mostly white, they are allowed to be independent. But in the areas of the Middle East, where there are people of color and of different cultures and different religions, they are not going to be trusted to be independent. They instead are going to be placed under the control of more powerful European nations like Britain and France. It doesn't hurt that they have access to oil, which both countries need to industrialize. So when we look at modern day problems in the Middle East and why they target England and France and by proxy the United States, this is where it begins. They were treated horribly by the Western Europeans and the United States effectively signed off on it. While we didn't go in and take over territory, we also looked the other way while we let this happen. All right, so here are the specifics of the 14 points. You can look it over. Um, again, you, you just need to know the major provisions that I talked about in uh, the previous slide. So the path to peace for Germany is going to be a very difficult one, right? This represents Germany, and if they're going to make it, they're going to have to accept more and more difficult things as a difficult climb to break out and finally have world peace. This isn't going to work out well for Germany. 
Um, as we know, World War II is going to happen within 20 years, and many of the reasons for World War II are a direct result of how they were treated during the Paris Peace Conference and by the Treaty of Versailles. All right, here's the problems. Uh, first of all, the United States, while we were part of the negotiations, initially we agreed to the Treaty of Versailles. President Wilson comes back home, puts the treaty before the United States Senate for ratification, for approval, and the U.S. Senate decides, nope, we don't like it. We don't want anything to do with this deal. We will create our own peace agreement with Germany. So right from the beginning, the United States backs out of the agreement they helped forge. Specifically, they back out of the League of Nations, which again, for Wilson's view, was the most important thing to get into the treaty to prevent future war. The United States, the creator of the League of Nations, will not join the League of Nations. Think about what that does to the credibility of the League. How do you take something serious when the person who created it won't be part of it. Germany was especially angry over the war guilt clause. They felt humiliated and betrayed, right? They felt like they were being punished for something that they were not fully responsible for and are taking all of the punishment. While Austria-Hungary is allowed to be independent, while the Ottoman Empire is allowed to be independent, Germany is going to have to pay for the war. They felt punished, and this makes them very angry. In addition, two countries that changed sides and joined on the, on the Allied side and gave us support with the expectation that they would be rewarded were Japan and Italy. Italy was promised land from Germany when the war was over, and Japan was promised technology and access to the German colonies to help them industrialize. Both were taken away from Italy and Japan. And in fact, the United States will see Japan as a growing threat in the region and will escalate and even do less trade with Japan than we did before. And we'll talk about that as the buildup for World War II. Okay, so Italy feels betrayed. Japan feels betrayed by the West. These are gonna, this is gonna come back to haunt us. This political cartoon kind of shows the importance of the United States being part of the League of Nations, that if the League of Nations is missing the United States, how can it possibly stand? The U.S. is what they call the keystone. Um, the keystone, as you can see in that little bridge, is the stone that sits in the middle where all the pressure is held on and holds everything together. If the United States is not going to be part of the League of Nations, how can the bridge stand is kind of the idea of this political cartoon. Okay, the war itself was extremely uh, damaging to Europe. Over eight and a half million people were killed on all between all of the countries that were fighting in the war. And another 21 million would be severely wounded, many of them crippled for life. So it was estimated that one in eight of all European men ages 16 to 35 were either killed or severely wounded and could not work because of the war. And by severely wounded also means mental illness, PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, what they referred to at the time as shell shock. Economically, the war devastated and crushed Europe. It cost Europe over $338 billion in actual money in fighting the war. In addition, it's means of regaining that wealth after the war, the factories, the homes, the roads, the farmland, all of this was destroyed. When World War II starts nearly 20 years later, uh, one of the things the French military has to do before moving in towards Germany is remove a bunch of unexploded bombs that were left over from World War I and were still sitting in farmland, never picked up. This is going to have a major impact on the world. It's going to create what we call disillusionment. Now, we talk about it in the book, a little bit of disillusionment, but I'm going to show it to you in a way that none of your other teachers will show you. Okay, I'm about to show you some art to show you that the world changed as a result of the war. 
Now, this is an extremely important concept to me because I want you to understand how our world got to where it is today. When people think of government today, there's anger, there's frustration, there's fear, this idea that government can't be trusted. Prior to World War I, that was not true. People believed in their government. Remember that, that rapid nationalism, right? We're the greatest nation in the world. We can do anything, right? We are superior. In fact, we have the right, the mandate from heaven to go and do good work. After World War I, the world is going to take on a little more shadow. It's going to be a little darker, a little more depressed. And we're going to see how it affects the thinking of future generations. We call this concept disillusionment. Disillusionment means basically that the world is meaningless, right? Suffering and pain are pointless. War was not unnecessary and war didn't serve anything. The people began to question everything in the world. They questioned their government. They questioned religion. They questioned their faith in their neighbors. All of this is going to be shown in writings and music and art that comes after the war. And I'll show you that in just a second. Okay, here's another short uh, thing on the Treaty of Versailles. Again, watch it on your own. I'm not going to show it now. You're more than capable of viewing it on your own time. All right, so let's look at what disillusionment means. This is some art from a soldier. This was a German soldier who created this art either while he was sitting in the trenches or after the war was over. It's not clear. But remember, if you look at art, so a lot of people, this is where I'm going to lose some of you. So please hang with me and I'll show you how to do this. Art is not difficult to read. A lot of people get all caught up. Oh, I don't understand art. It's too much. It's too hoity-toity, too, you know, uh, why? I don't get it. Here's the thing about art. Art is very simple to understand. Look at an image, look at a piece of art, and think to yourself, what do I feel? When I look at this picture, what do I feel? That's the first thing you do when looking at art. After that, then you start to look at specific details, right? So what do I feel? What is the artist trying to make me feel? And then I'm going to look for specific details. What are things that stand out to me? And can I connect them with things that I know and understand, right? So for example, we know this is a German soldier because we can tell the helmet, right? The mustache also shows he's a German. Right. The rifle is all busted up and cobbled back together. Right. So chances are at the end of the war, the soldiers were fighting with inferior equipment. You can see he's lost his boot and it's a uh, foot uh, foot rot. Right. Trench foot. Right. So we could see all kinds of little details that give us a feeling. Does this feel like a happy picture? Does this feel like, yay, I want to go off and fight a war? No. But if you remember from the film that we watched about the British soldiers and how they were excited to go off to war, you could see that what they expected to see and what the reality were, was, was very different for them. All right, so this is the first one. This again was a German soldier who created this art either while he was still in the trenches or after the war was over. This is, this is from a Russian artist. Right, so this is a Russian soldier's perspective of fighting against the Germans across the open frozen plains. Right, again, you can see what's the overall feeling. It feels cold, it feels empty, right? Death is all around us. If you look at the guy's eyes, he looks a little crazy, right? He's probably freezing cold. So again, looking for specific details to draw out what we feel and why we're feeling it. Right. So again, this is not a happy picture. This is not something that makes us feel like, yay, war is great. I want to go be a hero. This is this is the darker side of war. Okay. This was created by a French soldier uh, that he created after the war was over. Um, and again, this is as he put it when I read this, the uh, description of this art piece, uh, he created this because he felt like the memories of the war were worms crawling out of my mind and I had to get them out. This is how he was expressing his 
deep, dark fears, bad memories of the war through his art. All right, here we see some art from on the left, a German artist. Again, this is after the war. Uh, the artist of this was actually a reporter sent by Germany to cover the war. And these are some of the watercolor sketches that he did. The one on the right is by a French newspaper man who was showing the story of the soldiers uh, after dealing with a gas attack. So again, these are images that show up. These became part of newspaper articles, became part of magazine articles. This is how people saw the war. Because remember, World War I, while film was created and they were able to get film footage, you saw some of it in the film I showed you, um, they did not have television. So the only way to see it is if they showed it in a movie theater, which wasn't yet popular uh, in the world or through magazines and newspapers, which is where these, these drawings appeared. Okay, this is, the, this is an art from an American artist, who uh, a soldier who went over and fought, and his perspective on what was happening in France when he first arrived, and what the countryside looked like. Again, you can see looking at the colors, it doesn't look like a happy and cheery place. You know, the colors are lots of red, especially blood red and black, right? And you can get a sense of death and destruction everywhere you look, almost like the fires of hell, right? So again, you don't have to be an art major to understand art. Just again, look at what do you feel when you look at it? What are specific things that catch your attention? And what does that mean to you? This is one of my favorites. It's very dark and disturbing. Um, but that's kind of what I like about it, right? War is supposed to be messy. War is not supposed to be something we look at and go, yay, we want more of this. And so here you see a lot of symbols, a lot of feeling and passion, just death and destruction everywhere. We see reference to the gas attacks, right? Where he's wearing a gas mask, the fire and destruction. Um, we almost have like the angels pointing the way to hell. We see disease and vermin, right? Because these are like either bullet holes or lice or spiders or whatever, right? Just complete and utter devastation everywhere. All the little almost faces buried in the sand here. All kinds of things that we can see. Okay, thank you. Thanks for letting me know. All right, so um, again, these are all these symbols that you can look at and see that there were that there were people were struggling now to really show you what it looked like let's go back one sorry go back go back okay so now i'm going to show you how art changed what life was like before the war and how the world saw the world after the war so this is a famous painting called the siesta by the artist pablo picasso who was a spanish artist who traveled throughout Western Europe. He, he spent time in France, in Italy, studying the great works of art. He was well-known modern artist. His work featured bright colors, long curves, right? Beautiful, peaceful scenery, right? So here you see a farmer and presumably his wife taking a siesta out on their farm. The farm looks to be prosperous. The colors are bright and happy. It feels good, right? Where the world is at peace. This is the type of art that Picasso did before World War I. During World War I, Picasso became a newspaper reporter and he traveled covering the war uh, and saw violence of the war firsthand. So this is what his art looked like before the war. This is his art after the war. He went from everything is lovely, beautiful, and happy to depressing, dark feelings of death and fear and anger and whatever other emotions you want to equate to it. His art before the war, his art after the war. You can see a dramatic change. This change occurred to everyone who lived through World War I. 
They saw the world differently after. Here's another famous artist, Salvador Dali. Uh, again, very famous, traveled around the world with his art. Some of his art is in uh, museums all around the world. Uh, this is his art before the war, uh, what he called realism, where they made it very, where abstract realism, where it's realistic looking paintings in abstract or odd positions. Again, peaceful, colorful, again, a guy being crucified, you know, Jesus being crucified, probably not the most peaceful of images, but definitely a very different point of view than what he did after the war. Before the war, this is what his art looked like. Straight lines, good use of color, a feeling of peace, right, and quiet versus what he saw after the war, the chaos, the confusion, the senselessness. I've been looking at this image for about 17 years since I've been teaching world history. I've used this image every year. And every time I look at it, I get a different feeling. I see something new. I, I perceive something different. Again, art can be very intimidating. It's one of those things that people can freak out about and make you feel stupid because I don't get it. The thing is, is you do get it. You may not know all the little nuances and specialties of art, but in looking at these images, you feel, and that's what you need. So you can see that the man who created this, who is now creating this, is not the same person anymore. Something has changed in him. And what I believe and what I argue that it, that changed was his perspective of the world after seeing war. All right, that is it. Let me go ahead and pause the recording. Uh, let's see, pause.